Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Thales Press webinar entitled Thinking with the Pencil, the Art of Annotating and How to Teach It. My name is Winston Brady, and I'm joined here by Morgan Warfield, who's a junior high literature teacher at our Thales Academy Nightdale campus. I substitute taught for Mrs. Warfield back in the fall, and I noticed right away that her literature students had uh, in their copies of Aesop's Fables or King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, uh, their books were well annotated, lots of great comments in the margins. They were filled to the brim with sticky notes, pointing out things like plot points, character, literary devices, and the like. Uh, I was so impressed with what I saw in her classroom, especially since uh, Mrs. Warfield wasn't there in class that day um, that I, I knew that I had to share whatever Morgan was doing with her students with other teachers within our network. So that's what this webinar is all about. Uh, webinars like this and the ones that we put on, it's really about creating an opportunity where students and teachers can share ideas that make learning a joyful and engaging experience. I want to start off though with a quote from Mortimer Adler, true freedom is impossible without a mind made free by discipline. True freedom is impossible without a mind made free by discipline. For anyone who's not familiar with Mortimer Adler, he was a prominent philosopher at the University of Chicago and Columbia University. He lived from 1902 to 2001, and he was a huge proponent of a great books education. Uh, the kind of education common to many classical schools of which Thales is one. He was a very prodigious writer. He wrote tons of books, but amongst his best is uh, How to Read a Book, which uh, also has the most ironic title, mm -hmm. uh, How to Read a Book, that always gets a few chuckles out of people when you suggest uh, reading it to them. Um, in that book, uh, what he uh, urges the reader to do is to take books and their ideas seriously. Um, rather than reading books to passively get information, you should really be wrestling with the text, uh, asking questions of its author, engaging in a dialogue, and definitely writing notes in the margins um, as you think through some of the points that the author is making. For, for Adler, the goal is really increased understanding rather than just passively getting more and more information. Adler, though, is writing to college students educators, people that may not be on his level, but they're a lot closer, uh, a lot closer than perhaps the junior high students uh, that we that we have the privilege of teaching. They're really at the beginning of their journey when it comes to learning how to read well and adopting those habits of analytical reading. And so I'm so happy to have Morgan here yeah. to teach us uh, how we go about instilling those habits in students, how to annotate, how to take ideas seriously, and how to wrestle with great books and great texts. So Morgan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for your great. time, for your expertise. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Winston. I would also just like to give a shout out to my wonderful Thales students at Nightdale who listen and work really hard in literature to help make class fun and always involving with it. I've been teaching for, for 11 years, both in public and private sector in literature, history, science, pretty much any subject. And what I found is students always are confused. And I used to be confused when students asked me, well, Ms. Warfield, I don't understand what I just read. And then I would be taken back and I'd be like, what do you mean you don't understand what you just read? Like, I thought it was pretty straightforward. But as I went through my years of teaching and actually sitting down with certain students, I was noticing that they're getting lost in the translation almost. There's so many, I don't want to say filler words, but description of characters, description of the scene that you can kind of get lost and forget, okay, what actually is happening in this chapter? So I just come up with um, annotation that I used to use in school, dyslexic. So I had a hard time reading. So I feel like I developed some of these skills as well as of need because I didn't understand and I couldn't remember what I was reading. So that's why I like to implement the annotation skills in literature to help all students, regardless of their learning abilities. And we can break down the text and it's fun to get the kids ideas. So I'm going to go ahead and 
start the presentation with some of the slides. So the first slide, it says, I want to just kind of break down what is annotating, because, you know, when people say annotating, it can mean all sorts of things to different people. But I like to keep it to keep it pretty simple. It's the act of breaking down and making notes about what you've read. And this can vary from person to person, student to student. But there is, is a set path that you can use to break down any text for any student. And we're really just summarizing the thoughts in the margins of the book. So the way I like to look at everything is the key idea with this whole um, annotation system is I believe that if you read it, you write it, you apply it, then you've learned it. We're not wanting the kids to just memorize the information for a day or two. We want them to actually take it in and learn from it and add to their schooling with other literary books. And this can be applied to any subject, history, science, anything can be broken down into simpler terms. So again, this is what annotation can help the students achieve. Okay, so what the benefits of annotating are? Well, it makes the students, one, stop and read slowly. It promotes active reading, where the students are actually kind of coming alive with the characters, maybe going through what the characters are feeling at the moment. And that gives them a better visual of the whole story line and plot as the book progresses. So that's why annotations can be very helpful. I've also noticed with annotating, when you finish reading a book in literature, we have a unit test. And that unit test covers from the very beginning of the book to the end of the book. And when students are trying to study for that test, they can get overwhelmed. But if they have their annotation notes, they can go back and don't have to read the whole book. They can go back and look at the key highlights from the book and refresh their memories of what's going on with characters and settings. That's why I think annotation could be applied to every single area. However, annotating can get a little bit out of hand. I have to come back my students with the amount of stuff that they highlight because I would say, okay, I want you guys to annotate this passage from Robin Hood and then half the books highlighted. And that's not very helpful. So we really want to break it down to make them stop, think, and the very basic level, ask themselves these questions, and then that will help them figure out what's going on in the story. And it, and it can be, you can tailor annotations to your own system. So if somebody likes to circle words instead of highlighting, they can circle it. If they wanna draw pictures to represent an idea, they can write a picture or draw a picture that will help them remember the story. So annotation is very um, self-guided. What you will need, some of the materials you would need to annotate, obviously a pencil, color pens are optional. I always like to use different colors, maybe have one color for vocabulary, one color for maybe figurative language, similes, metaphors, things like that. Post-it notes, if you're not allowed to write in the book, or maybe you don't have a personal book to write notes in, you can definitely use sticky notes and an annotation guide. So how do you model the art of annotating in a large classroom setting? The first thing I like to use is depending on if I'm working with sixth, seventh or eighth graders or any grade above is to set a found foundation first. So you can use apps like Explain Everything to help kind of showcase it. So what that would look like is you would pull up and as you're reading through it with the students, you would stop and say, okay, what happened in this sentence or who's working in the story of Robin Hood? And then you could write it down along with the students. Um, I also like to read the story out loud to my students. I also have students read aloud to the class. When I have a large group, to make sure that the students are following along and actually reading, I'll start reading a paragraph from the book, and then I will pause on a certain word. 
And when I pause on that word, the students are supposed to respond with whatever that word is. So that shows me that they are listening to me read the story to them. This also helps with class discussions. And we'll give, we're gonna model an example of that in a few minutes, but it gets the kids involved too and keeps them accountable for what we're reading, who's involved in it, what's going on, and be able to have meaningful discussions and not being like, great, how'd you guys feel about chapter one? Moving on. Okay, so at the beginning of class, I would say, okay, students, come in, sit down, take out your sticky notes, your highlighters, your book, the packet, if I have given them a packet, and I like, get ready to annotate. I like to start off class with a warm up question, depending on whatever we're reading for the day. That warm up question will be based on stuff that they should have read last night for homework or what we covered in class. Then we would have a quick discussion and then I'd go right in to starting to read the chapter to the students. Um, I like to utilize reading checks and quizzes. This is where I also try to show them why annotation is important. When we get our reading checks, what I like to do with the students is pass them back. They need to check their annotations with the questions on the reading check. And while they're comparing the two, they are to be making notes in the margins of the book or on another sticky note. Yes, I had the annotations to answer this question. Or they would say to themselves, oh no, I missed that. Maybe I should pay attention to that next time. So as they continue, reading, they'll start growing the skills themselves. They'll start seeing what types of questions can be asked um, on a reading check or what types of um, information am I looking for for a good classroom discussion. How you would grade something like that. What I would have them do is on their iPads and in Canvas, they would upload, a, they would take a picture, so they would take their iPads, and they would upload a picture from their book. They take it, put it in Canvas. And then that night or during the day during my planning, I will actually go through and click on their pages. And I will quickly glance over what they have annotated. I would leave comments like, this is great annotations. You've got the place names correct. You're picking up on the characters. Yes, this is a simile. Or maybe they marked something that was a simile and it's not a simile. And I'd be like, that's not a simile, here's why. And then I'll leave comments like that. And that's how you can kind of take annotation for a grade, usually like a homework completion grade. And you can actually see the kids learning and where they're following, falling short at, with that. And again, that in itself is annotating. I am making notes on the kids' annotations and reading what they're annotating. So then I get asked the question, well, what is, what is important? What do I need to know? And I to just really keep it simple. The basic, almost interrogative type question. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? And I've listed some example questions on the slide here that I want the students to start asking themselves once they finish reading either a page or a chapter. So for example, who is the story about? So in Robin Hood, who's the story about? Well, it's about Robin Hood, his merry men, Rob, uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham, King John. And that would be important facts that they would need to know about the whole story. Then who appears in the chapter? So instead of getting overwhelmed with all the characters in Robin Hood, we focus on one chapter. And in that chapter, we write down only the characters that appear in that chapter. Then you could ask yourself, what happened in that chapter? Okay, they, Robin Hood fought the Sheriff of Nottingham. Great, write that down. Then the next question would be, what do the characters look like? How do they describe Robin Hood? Is Robin Hood described as young? 
perceptive? Does he have great archery skills? And those will be types of questions that you could see on reading checks and quizzes. Then where? How did Robin Hood escape? Why was he angry at the sheriff? Why did King John want to take the um, throne over from King Richard? All of those questions help break down and simplify the information about the chapters. So when they're asking, I don't know what to annotate, you can just tell them, well, think of the simple questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then there's another example questions that I've linked on, on the PowerPoint as well. And hopefully they start, these questions become second nature to them as they go through. All right, so um, next part is teaching annotations. Um, and this part of the section, I'm going to help um, get help from Mr. Brady to Winston to kind of facilitate what it looks like in the class as we're reading a chapter um, in the book. So again, I was like, okay, students, go ahead, get out all your stuff to annotate and your packets. And then I would start off reading the chapter and they would have the book in front of them as well. And then I would, if I'm doing a whole group, I'll pause at a, I'll pause at a certain word, came out of the screen, and then I would have them say the word with me. So I'll start off. Although there was so much to do in Sherwood, where nearly all the food they ate had to be hunted, trapped, or shot, and they were always in danger of surprise from the Sheriff of Nottingham, Sir Guy of Gisborne, and the rest, Robin Hood, occasionally found time hung heavy on his hands. Who can raise their hand and tell me what figurative language or device is being used here when it says, Robin Hood occasionally found time hanging heavy on his hands? Well, and if we were in class, right, we would, uh, I would want to write a little note there in the side. And I'd be wanting to, thinking about different types of literary devices. Because this could be a number of different ones, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And so we could, uh, I could maybe write some of my justification off of the side. Mm -hmm. We, uh, at Thales, we tend to call on students at random. So we don't call on students who have their hands raised or something right. like that. But this is nice to give that sort of think time. Uh, that way, every, they at least have something that they can provide. Um, all right. So time, hang, hung, time, hang, hang heavy on his hands. So we've got three different consonant sounds, mm -hmm. three of the same consonant sounds, that H sound, that aspirated sound. So alliteration might be one. Yep, alliteration, alliteration be one. would be one. Okay, so I might write alliteration on, on the yep. side, on the mm -hmm. side there. Um, let's see, this could be something of a metaphor? Yes, a metaphor, okay. yep. And how would it be a metaphor? What are the two things comparing? What are we comparing with Robin Hood? Um, well, there's... I mean, his anxiety mm -hmm. and his anxiety is kind of like a burden that he's carrying, but it's not like a burden. It's just like a burden in that it's maybe crushing him like yeah. or Christian from Pilgrim's Progress or something like that. Yeah, very good. And it can also, it's a statement of an idiom. So then I would tell the students, the wonderful, write all of those off into the side and describe to me why it's an idiom or why it's a metaphor on the or alliteration for it. And then I would just continue reading on to the next part. On one such occasion, he and little John were walking by the high road to Nottingham, where it runs through the forest when they saw a butcher with his cart of meat come jogging along the way. Then, okay, I would stop and say, okay, who do we have involved here? And the students would say, okay, we have the butcher. What is he pushing? A cart. Good. Write that down. And that would kind of be how we would go through and read the book. At that point, we're really just trying to get bare bones, yes. fundamentals, elements of plot, characters, and setting. Mm -hmm. And then we can build up from there to the more nuanced language, elements of, of literary devices, themes, yeah. character development. But trying to start from that 
the eat most obvious and discernible things to more nuanced and difficult things. That really where is the, the love of literature, the joy of literature, we're actually getting to talk about yeah. more engaging and more enriching passages. Mm -hmm. And then once they have that foundation, I would go back and I'd be like, has anybody experienced a time where they felt that time hung heavy on their hands, that it was just so boring or so painful that they just couldn't wait for it to end. And then again, that gives class discussion. They have text-based evidence, which is a really hard to get from students at this age. Okay, prove to me where you got that example and then apply it to your own life. And that's how annotation done. They can get the basic and apply it and develop and go even deeper into the thinking. Morgan, how about your annotation guide? Can you walk us through the symbols that you use and uh, teach the students? Yes. So here you could um, kind of cater it to yourself. If you don't like to circle or underline things, you could switch it off. But for the most part, my students usually follow for vocabulary words, we circle it. So under on the guide right here for the explanation, powerful words or phrases, this means vocabulary that we're learning or even words that they don't know. So they would circle it. Um, then you would underline, I have them underline phrases that they don't understand. They could also use question marks there on the margins. Like if they were reading the passage about Robin Hood and they didn't understand what time hangs heavy on his hands mean, then they could put a little question mark and ask that question in class. So again, it gives teacher and student rapport back and forth about what's reading. Um, exclamation points can be used um, for anything that they find exciting or shocking in there, or even they can use the exclamation points to allude to, hey, look here, this is important. This was a test question. Um, we highlight, and I like to do highlighting, not the whole sentence, just the key words. So again, with the annotations, these examples on here on the slide about symbols, that it can be totally switched out from here. So like my students don't use arrows. Um, they don't do examples with EX, but that doesn't mean they can't. It's just what feels more comfortable to the students with that guide. So I um, have some examples on the slide of my annotations that I would post to the students, especially if they have to read a chapter by themselves. The next day I'll have my annotation posts. And again, they can compare the two to see what they're annotating and what I'm annotating and fill in anything in between. And then I get the examples. I have a sticky note that I like to do for vocabulary. And then I have a sticky note that the students have to do for characters. Then I have a separate sticky note for plot summaries. So all of it's not jumbled into one. So my students always have at least three different sticky notes, characters, vocabulary, and plot points and then they can use that. If they don't want to use sticky notes, there's a welcome to use a sheet of paper and it's done the exact same way. They would have a category for vocabulary, they'd have a category for plot summary, and they have a category um, for characters as well. And then they could circle it in their book. So this one is actually an example of a student and this is self-guided. This is one that I was absent um, and the students were doing, and you can see here that she did follow the sticky notes examples. She has one for her vocabulary, she has one for her plot points, and she has one for the characters. And if you notice, she's highlighted not the whole sentence, which is good because too much highlighting, it's useless. It gets, it gets the student overwhelmed and they don't really remember it. So I have them go in and highlight key words here, and then they can write off into the margins. So these are just ones for Aesop's fables. I don't know if those of you that are teaching at Thales with Aesop's, it is very difficult to get the students to figure out um, what the story is actually 
talking about, like what's the moral there. So then I would go back through and I'd give them the moral and then I would have them use their annotation to support it. Okay, what words in this reading show that it's you know, revenge hurts the Avenger? Like where in this story is it showing that the man got hurt for trying to kill the fly for just the fly being a fly type of thing? were the examples right and so we were just reading with Winston the uh, adventures of Robin Hood which we read in seventh grade my students really enjoyed the story of Robin Hood and there's so many fun characters in there that the students kind of were able to relate to the story I mean it's a love story it's an adventure it has archery in it, it has a happy ending everything that you know, would keep students engaged and have really good in depth and maybe even have them remember it. Maybe when they're in college and they read something on Robin Hood or they hear something about, like if we read Cyrano, they can connect the dots like, oh, I remember that sword fighting. Okay, Robin Hood was a great archer. I learned this in literature. And then they can apply it and go forward with things of that nature. And the goals for in-class reading for literature so don't get like overwhelmed, would just be, we really want to establish the characters, the setting and the tone of the story and identify any literary devices being used, similes, metaphors, alliteration, those types of things that they will get tested on at the end of the school year, either with Iowa's or end of grade testing. And we also wanna create new knowledge and new pathways for when they get older, they know how to break down a text. And when they get more complex readings, they can at least know, okay, these are my characters. This is the setting. Now I can take this and apply. What does the author mean here? What is the purpose of um, time hanging heavy? Why does this add to the story? And with those fundamentals down, again, it brings a deeper meaning into the story for the students. This is just the example of the passage that we were reading from and how my annotations were in the margins. I wrote, you know, how if he's frustrated, he's bored, time passing away, stress is weighing him down. And this is what like the minimum annotations of students can do. And if this was a student's book, it might look a little different. They might only have one thing written off to the side or maybe they've highlighted it instead of started or exclamation pointed. But the point is it's drawing their attention to something that is important in the book that adds to the character and meaning of the story. So I hope that helps give you some idea on how to kind of start the annotation process. And if you have any questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box um, along the Zoom window. I can start off with questions. Morgan, do you buy these materials, uh, like the post-it notes and things like that? That was uh, one impediment for me, because yep. I always felt like I was running out of post-it notes if I was going to ask students to annotate in this way. Um, I recognize that's a really great, uh, really great solution there to that problem, because if your school's like ours, um, a lot of times books are really like class sets. And so we kind of discourage kids from from writing in them. Um, and yet that's really the really the best way to, yeah. to aid in comprehension. So do you buy these materials or uh, donated kids buy them themselves? And um, the kids can buy them themselves. Um, well, I usually put it on the supply list before um, school starts on the materials that they would need. And here at Thales, we do like rewards or something. So our prize box has, you know, fun sticky notes in there, highlighters of different colors, you know, trying to get the kids excited about it. So I personally don't care what kind of sticky notes they're using. Um, it's just anything to make it really fun and stand out to the students. But yes, I would ask them to buy those materials themselves. We have some at school, but it would just be your typical boring yellow ones. Mm -hmm. So, yes. 
I have a follow-up question too. One thing that I do with uh, especially history books, philosophy books, is I'll make my own table of content text. I'm sorry, Kate, table of contents or something like an index in the last two or three pages. Do you do anything like that with students or like making like I'm looking for this theme? And so I'm going to write it down in the back couple pages and then uh, write down the pages where that particular theme comes in. So do you do anything like that, making their own table of contents, making their own index in the back of the book? Um, yeah, we usually do it in the front or the back of the book. So before we start over a book, I'll go over maybe there's one big theme about the book. Uh, maybe good versus evil. And then we would write that in the front of the book. And then we could go back to there anytime we read a passage that has to do with good defeating evil. We would go back and put the page number down, like page 12, chapter 10, where Robin Hood defeats the sheriff of Nottingham. That can be the most simplest form of good versus evil. So yeah, we would do that in the front of the book. And if they can't write in the book, a sheet of notebook paper, off to the side with specific titles will work just as well. That's a really good tip. Well, we're getting some wonderful uh, questions in the Q&A box, so please keep those coming. I'll read out this first one. Uh, could you explain, Morgan, your thoughts on the benefit of teaching literary devices and then having them annotate those devices? How does that help drive engagement with the meaning of the text? Uh, when I've tried this, it seems like it distracts them from the meaning behind it. Um, so how do you go about doing that in a meaningful way? Um, for the literary devices, I try not to harp too much on it, but it is to kind of give them an idea for when they start their writing process of the literature part that gives them creativity to express more deeply about what their character is trying to come across. Um, and that seems like that's very minute at this point. And if your students can only handle characters, plot line, very simple, that's fine. But then they have that information where you can be like, okay, how does this metaphor add to Robin Hood? Do you feel that if they just said Robin Hood was bored, does that, is that better than saying time hung heavy on Robin Hood's hands? Like you, they can start to see how that adds like fluidity or, you know, more emotion to the story than just saying he was bored. And I think too, the comprehension piece of it as well, that uh, in, in writing, like for me, I personally can't uh, pay attention to a book if I, if I don't have a pencil with me. So I'm not, if I'm not underlining, if I'm not writing notes in the margins, it helps me understand and get invested in the story more. So with, at least in my experience with literary devices and calling attention to those, um, you're helping the students work through and process that particular literary device. I, I also use it, I think you, you, you do the same thing, but uh, you know the one that we honestly chose kind of at random with uh, Robin Hood and the butcher, time hanging heavy, uh, nuanced language is just that, it's nuanced. You can't, you don't really, uh, the author used words in such a way that the meaning isn't obvious at the first reading. So you kind of have to chew on it. You have to think through, you have to wrestle with it and um, giving the students some, you know, 30 seconds of think time followed by, um, you know, them writing down, you know, their kind of answer, their justification for why that literary device is the literary device that it is. Um, you know, that's the kind of the joy because it's not, there's not necessarily a right answer. They're just better answers or yeah. better argued answers. What would you say? Yeah, I would say better are argued answers. And then it, it helps them to not just be like, well, this is useless. Why did they put that in there? You know, um, they can connect it and then support their answers, which is really big that we're trying to teach in literature um, to support your arguments with facts from the book. Mm -hmm. And these things can help. And we've got another question too. I'll read it out. Uh, in the Robin Hood example, is that an example of teaching literacy writing techniques throughout the novel? Um, in the example showed, um, 
uh, time hanging heavy on Robin Hood's hands, metaphor, alliteration, idiom. The phrase, though, and I think this is a really valid point on the part of the participant, the phrase isn't super important to the story. Um, it's not necessarily something that uh, maybe foreshadows, or though maybe it does. I've, it's been a while since I taught Robin Hood, seventh grade literature. Um, was this an example of foreshadowing? or Because that would be something that you would highlight. Um, yeah you know, some important literary device that maybe prefigures something that's coming on later. Yeah, because um, Robin Hood is known to be pretty um, hot-headed and likes to act before he thinks about it. And as you continue reading the story, you can use that to justify, yeah, Robin Hood is kind of a hothead because he's so bored, he's going to try to look for something else. And that's how he comes upon the butcher. And that's how they set up this big scheme to get um, the sheriff of Nottingham out into the forest. So it that part is important to develop Robin Hood's character throughout the story to show that, yes, he is hot-headed. He does not think all the time. And if he's bored, he's going to go find some trouble to get into. Thales, a lot of classical schools have this approach, but you read primary sources in high school and you read um, adaptions in middle school. So this is Roger Lanceling Greens. Um, if you're unfamiliar with him, he was a friend of C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, um, member of the Inklings, but he writes a number of really great adaptions of, uh, you know, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Um, but we read a number of his books throughout our middle school curriculum. And, uh, you know, sometimes, like, when I, when I read, I'm sure you're the same way, but reading with students in class, you want to try to ask a question for every maybe two or three paragraphs or so, mm -hmm. at least one per page, depending on how difficult it is. Um, you don't want the students to just be reading for the sake of reading yeah. and reading too long that they all of a sudden just kind of lose track of where they are. So like if I were reading that, I would probably focus on that exact same phrase there because that's, you know, as far as the nuanced word choice, yeah. that's really the most interesting sentence um, in that opening paragraph. And it does set up, I think you've hit on a really good thing there. He's He's getting antsy and probably about to get into trouble. Yes. And he does. If you continue reading the book, um, it does progress that way. And uh, the Q&A box should be up at the top of the Zoom window. There was somebody who mentioned they're not seeing the questions being posted. Um, I'm, I'm not answering them in the chat, but I can maybe type something out later. Um, we have one more question, it looks like. I've struggled with having students annotating. They seem to think of it as such a chore. Uh, rather than something that aids them to understanding the text. Any thoughts about that? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, first they're going to think it's silly and they're not going to want to do it. And then that's kind of where I start. Okay, well, I'm taking a grade for it. You have to do it because I'm taking a grade for it. And I hate to start it off that way, but they're not going to see it by themselves unless they start seeing, oh, these annotations help me with this test question. So when they start seeing that, they hopefully like intrinsically motivates them <laughs> to want to annotate. And it does help to use different colors and pens. I know my girl students love different sticky notes and highlighting and using colors of that nature, but it really does take a front load. It, it does take a good chunk of time to get the steps in place and for them to actually see the importance and how well it helps them. And I was surprised when I left um, my students that one day, I didn't tell them to annotate in my sub plans. Um, Mr. Brady came in and was my sub and the students were just doing it themselves. Like I didn't tell him to tell the students to annotate. So um, we're hoping to build it like an intrinsic, like they want to to do this because it is beneficial. They see that it's helpful. And it's not just because Ms. Warfield told them to do, or I'm going to get a grade on it. So. 
Yeah, and I think there they're seeing some of the fruits that yeah. come with, with I mean, honestly, just taking their reading a little bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. um, it does force you to slow down, to pay more close attention to the sentences that you're underlining or the ideas that you're expressing in a summary along the yep. margins. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they're getting better grades, you know, there's a nice positive feedback yep. loop so that they'll continue buying into the system, continue annotating. Um, I'd also say too that you've made the system pretty fun. Um, colors and things like that it makes yeah. the book really pop uh, a lot more so than if uh, if it was just blank. You know, uh, certainly there are books on my shelf that the spine is worn, pages are dog-eared. You know, it looks like somebody has chewed on it. I mean, I've metaphorically chewed on it, yeah. <laughs> um, but those are those are books that I personally loved and invested a lot of time in. You can you can certainly see that in the book itself. Um, I think for a student, I would feel a lot more overwhelmed if I came to a book that was blank, yeah. you know, like finding a plot point or some sort of literary device if I had to write an essay. Uh, for me, that was always the, especially writing research papers, that yeah. would be so hard, right? If you found a really good quote, but you can't find it again when you need to put it into your paper. Mm -hmm. So that might be a number of things just to try to, to keep in mind, um, you know, there, there is something of if it's it's for grades, so the student has to do it. But also, there there should be some really good, meaningful fruit that comes along with this process, and not just better grades, but also reading comprehension. I also have a one liner that I use a lot. Yep. That um, you know, anything that's hard is probably worth doing. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a seven year old at home that uh, really struggled to learn how to ride his bike. Took an awful long time. Um, but now he's riding it like a champ. And anytime that I, I need to remind him that he needs to just try a little bit harder and he'll get over that hump, he'll get over that curb, I just point to the bike. Um, and I think annotating is certainly the same thing. Yeah. You, can, you can read a lot quicker, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not annotating, yep. but you're not understanding anything. You're not broadening your understanding. Yeah. And we've got time for more questions. And I see another one in the chat now. But how many reading and annotating lessons would you do with a class typically in a week? And I've, I've got my answer, but Morgan, I want to yeah. hear yours. Well, it really depends on the class and how well they're taking to the story or how deep the book is. Um, usually I'll read one chapter to the students and we'll stop, discuss, annotate it. And then the next the night for homework, they'd read six pages. So I think we're allowed to assign six pages here. Mm -hmm. So I would say maybe three to four chapters a week, three with my guidance and two on their own. And then we come back and have a big class discussion or I would post my annotations and that would give them a chance to compare theirs to mine and learn like, oh yeah, I'm getting exactly what Miss Warfield got from this book, or I need to note this because she might ask that on a test coming up. Mm -hmm. My answer is the same as yours, as, as often as you need to. Mm -hmm. So younger grade levels, uh, perhaps more, yeah. I mean, as many as you need to. Um, so holding the students accountable for the reading. So whether it's annotations check, or perhaps are, are some sort of reading comprehension quiz, like an entrance quiz mm -hmm. when students come into class that day. But that just um, communicates that they need to do the reading, take it seriously, because uh, they're going to be asked questions about it. Um, the annotations check, I also think is pretty brilliant, mm -hmm. um, just because it's just another way uh, for students to show that they've at least attempted the assignment. Doesn't mean that they've you know done the most amazing right. job ever, but we're really going for at least that that bit of effort, mm -hmm. um, putting your best foot forward and so forth. Um, older classes, I think the heart of the book probably just find the more annotations and, mm -hmm. and so on. But at that point, it should be a little bit more natural. Yeah. So maybe you don't have to take as many for a grade. Um, I think every school is going to be different at Thales. Um, we typically have somewhere around three to five kind of classwork grades a week. Mm -hmm. And that's usually a mix of, of accuracy grades. And so that's, at least for me, where the reading comprehension questions come yes. in, since those are more cut and dry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this happened in this chapter and, and so forth. This was the, the plot and the yeah. elements in it. Um, and then completion grades, which may be annotations, but also maybe journal prompts mm -hmm. or some sort of reflection piece, something that it's a little harder for me to grade as a teacher. And also it's not really fair to grade the kids 
on how well they answered some question that was uh, really deep and open-ended. Yeah. So I think as, as, as often as you need to, and then also in line with your school's expectations and policies concerning grades. Yeah. For us, three to five assignments a week is, is pretty reasonable mm -hmm. um, and so on. So and that was a great question there. And we do have one more question in the chat box. So I'll go ahead and read it out. Uh, how can I balance annotating with the large amount of reading I have to get through over the course of the year? How do I help students to achieve a balanced approach to annotating? Or would you recommend having them annotate certain sections more in depth than others? And um, there's a little bit of context here. Uh, this particular school has um, the same sorts of limitations that we do, mm -hmm. um, 20 minutes of homework per subject per night. Yeah. And we have a similar rule. Um, if uh, for us in reading, it's one page per grade level mm -hmm. per night. So seventh grade can read seven pages, eighth grade can read eight pages. Um, there's a spirit of the law behind that rule. The spirit of the law there is that we're not trying to overwhelm students with yeah. meaningless homework. At the same time, though, we're not trying to protect students from actually working yeah. and, and reading. So it's definitely a kind of a balancing act there. We don't want to overwhelm students that they begin to dread their studies, but trying to give them something that's meaningful. Um, you've got the same constraints, though, teaching yeah. English literature. What would be your first response there? Um, I would, depending on like when we did the Hobbit, there was so much description of detail that walking, yeah, so much, it's walking. So much walking and it's a great book, <laughs> very worthwhile, but there is a lot of walking. Yes. And the students were getting lost I and mean, they would read two pages and they'd be like, I think they are still walking. And they're like, you know, he uses a lot of descriptive words for trees and stuff. So that I would the Hobbit took a little bit longer, and it, I think it depends on how your your principal of the school runs it. That maybe you don't get through twelve books in a school year; you get to three or four really good solid books. So, depending on your admin, you could talk about maybe okay, can we hit these three books that are most important, and then spend some time because. Once they have the skill to annotate, I feel like they'll be able to break down text and it'll get easier and easier um, as they go forth mm -hmm. on it. And it just depends on if they're struggling, then you would just have to take it slower and maybe you read to them more than you have them read. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would stop and then you would discuss it maybe after two pages and then give them time to write it down. It would just depend on how well your class is doing and what you're expectations are at the school, I would think. Yeah. And I think that's uh, probably one of the best solutions, building more time in class for reading. Yeah. Would you say you do a Definitely. lot of that? Oh, yeah. A lot of it's in class reading. Yep. And that allows you to model some of these mm -hmm. habits. It encourages conversation because that's really what seminars teaching really is. Yeah. You've got a really good text in front of you. You as the teacher who's a few steps ahead of the student asking students questions about what's valuable and insightful in that particular work of, of literature or philosophy. Um, so certainly making more time in, in class for doing these sorts of, you know, in class reading and so forth, then you can really model yeah. what you're hoping the students to do. Um, we also have one book per quarter that's required. Um, at Thales, our curriculum, uh, we have ancient literature and ancient history in sixth grade, medieval and modern European li literature, medieval, modern European history in seventh grade, American literature, American history in eighth grade. And so we have really one kind of required book per quarter. There's some flexibility depending on the grade level in the semester. But uh, beyond that one book per quarter that the teacher has to get through, we have some suggested readings uh, that they can do uh, in addition to that. But what we're trying to do there is give teachers a little bit more uh, flexibility and breathing room in their pacing guides so that uh, they feel, you know, in the back of their minds that they can slow down and that they don't have to you know, race through every book on the text list over mm -hmm. the course of the year. Because um, we don't want students to burn out yeah. and to develop 
like a dislike of reading, you know, the goal through our program is not that we finish every book on the syllabus, but that our students come out of it loving reading and loving to learn and, yeah. and you know, that they're reading books. They have the, the brain space to read books on their own. Mm -hmm. So at least I try to keep that goal in mind that I just want the kids to not only become better readers, but to become better, you know, that they enjoy reading that much more. Well, wonderful. I don't think we've got any more questions in the chat box, but if uh, anything should come to mind, you know, please feel free to email me, winston.brady at baileysacademy.org. Um, you can email Mrs. Warfield as well, morgan.warfield mm -hmm. at baileysacademy.org. Yeah. You can also check out our website if you're interested more about our program and things that we offer. We would love to field questions. Um, so on behalf of Thales Press, thank you to everyone who has attended this webinar. Um, if you're interested more in the unique brand of classical education that we have here at Thales Academy, please be sure to check us out at our website at www.thalesacademy.org. Morgan, thank you so much for your time on this webinar. Thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. So until next time, stay classy and stay classical. <laughs>